As a scout, explorer, and Indian fighter, Kit Carson has seen more adventure on the frontier than almost anyone alive. We need to go, Major. <clears throat> Track is still fresh. But after setting out to rescue Ann White, an American woman kidnapped by Apaches, Carson faces his most urgent and dangerous challenge yet. We need to attack, sir, now. And now that he's got the Apaches within reach, Carson knows they must attack at once. We're wasting time, sir. Nobody move, that's an order. But these ferocious warriors aren't going down without a fight. Now, the fate of Ann White hangs on the outcome of a risky cavalry attack, with Kit Carson personally leading the charge. Kit Carson is the ultimate Western icon and a legend in his own time. Well, of all the great scouts of the West, if we look at uh, Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, Buffalo Bill Cody, and Kit Carson, Carson is the most impressive of them all. It's a legend based on both real-life events and lurid stories in which fact and fiction intertwine. Hollywood couldn't have produced a more interesting story than the truth about Kit. It's the most fantastic. Patches, wasn't they? And sometimes the most unbelievable story. He's sort of a frontier forest gump. He goes everywhere, from the Northern Plains to the Mexican borderlands, to the Pacific coast and what is now Oregon and California. He really was one of the greatest American frontiersmen, if not the greatest. As a youth of humble origins, Carson could scarcely even dream of the fame he'd one day attain. Kit Carson was born in Kentucky in 1809, actually the same year as Abraham Lincoln. The family moved out to Boone's Lick, Missouri, following the trail of his cousin, Daniel Boone. There his father was killed in an accident, and uh, the young boy uh, proved pretty unruly to his mother, and so she apprenticed him to a saddler so he could learn a trade and make something out of himself. I'm up to here in the stream. My rifle is on the rocks. Comanches all around me. The shop was constantly full of men preparing to, to go on the trail or coming off of it, uh, coming in to get their leather goods and equipment repaired. Whack! Tomahawk hits me in the back. Oh. What'd you do? I hit the water. I dove in like an otter. The arrows was flying everywhere. In the process, Kid is listening to all of these fantastic stories of the beauty, the adventure, the romance of the West, if you will. One of them hit me right here. See? Inch over there, and I'm done for. And that's a true story. Kit wanted adventure. He wasn't going to allow himself to uh, be making saddles the rest of his life. At the tender age of 16, Young Kit decides to seek his destiny on the frontier. Kit Carson does a huck fin, and he sneaks away, hooks up with a wagon train that's heading out to uh, Santa Fe. It's the beginning of an extraordinary career. Over the next several years, Carson comes of age on the frontier, traveling far and wide as a hunter, trapper, and scout. A young guy lives for adventure. Kit and the rest of those mountain men had adventures every day. After years of danger and excitement on the frontier, Carson has had an education unlike anything he'd have gotten in school. Now, 
E no apa! E descostos! Chou Chua! He, like most of these old, old mountain men, had a keen ear for, for languages. He couldn't read or write to any appreciable extent, but uh, could speak Spanish better than English and French, along with the native languages that he knew. Where'd you pick that up from, Sonny? Well, you sound just like one of them. You speak a few words, talk some Spanish and French and Shoshone and Comanche too. You're kidding me. He's got a knack, I guess. His life was at risk constantly, uh, both from wild animals and, uh, and from Indian peoples. Uh, but still, he enjoyed every minute of it. In 1842, Kit Carson first encounters the man who will change his life forever. And it was just at this time as well that the fur trade was changing from beaver, which had gone out of style. Not only had the West been overtrapped, but uh, silk hats had come into fashion. A beaver that would bring $5 overnight was worth nothing. And so Kit and uh, the other mountain men had to go find another way to make a living. First class, please. It was just at this time, Lieutenant John C. Fremont is about to launch an expedition to explore the Oregon Trail. Excuse me, sir. Do you have the correct time? Don't carry your pocket watch. You're a trapper, I take it. I am. Well, I was. Can't make a living at it no more. Yes, I've heard the beaver are trapped out. No surprise, really. What's your business? I'm an explorer by trade. I work for the federal government. Fremont is as green as you can possibly be, full of great romance and intentions, but really brought no particular capacity for wilderness exploration. Along with his father-in-law, the powerful Senator Thomas Benton, John Fremont is a fervent believer in manifest destiny. Nature had given Americans the right to subdue this continent, and that's what Fremont's expeditions were all about. Let's map out this new territory. I'm outfitting an overland expedition to map out the Oregon Trail. In fact, I'm looking to hire on a guide who knows these western mountains well. I'll miss some time in the mountains. Guide you any point you wish to go. We've got some time before the steamboat departs. Care to join me for lunch? Kit was hired for $100 a month, which was more than he had ever seen, of course. And, and this begins uh, one of the great partnerships of American history. They form a great bond. They become very good friends, but even more so, their partnership is going to map out the entire American West. The partnership between these unlikely friends proves incredibly successful. With Carson leading the way, Fremont's expedition surveys vast regions of America's wilderness. But John Fremont's ambition isn't limited to mere exploration. He seeks fame as well. Taking Green out to hunt elk. Oh, Kit, I've been writing notes for my report. Read them and let me know if there's anything of importance I've missed. Well, thing is, I can't read, sir. As he was growing up, Kit had no education whatsoever, and in fact, for the rest of his life, was illiterate. He could never read, and he could never write. Ah, uh, yes, of course. My apologies. Well, you'll be glad to know that your name features prominently beside mine throughout the account. Why is that then? Well, because you deserve it. What I mean is, 
Why would I be glad to be written in your book? Well, when it's published, it'll be a sensation. You'll be the most sought after guide on the frontier. Famous, dare I say. Truth is, I don't want none of that, I reckon. Anyways, I was just saying that me and Green was gonna go hunt out. Be back tomorrow, midday. What an extraordinary young man. I think there's a, uh, a direct line between courage and not drawing attention to yourself. I think there's a difference between a show off and someone who runs towards the crash. And I think that's eternal. I think that uh, uh, most people who are really courageous, if you ever meet them, they'd rather talk about something else. And that's part of the enigma, that's part of the attraction. Uh, but then when it comes time to portray that on screen or in a book or whatever, you have to give them that bigger than life thing. And that's a contradiction and not necessarily true. Fremont's first expedition is a great success. And as predicted, his published reports become a nationwide sensation. 10,000 copies are printed and, and circulated. And these become the guidebooks that people use as they take the Oregon Trail. Fremont, of course, is the hero of these stories, the Pathfinder, and Kit Carson is his heroic guide, his scout who's going to show the way, and they both become huge American heroes. Kit is a, is a quiet, very much low-profile kind of guy, no interest in the public eye, uh, very opposite to Fremont. Uh, Fremont was a person who wanted attention and sought it out. Yet despite his modesty, a dramatic incident in the Mojave Desert helps make Kit Carson a household man. On their way back from California in the Mojave Desert, Fremont's party comes upon a bedraggled Mexican man and his, and his young son, and they relate a terrible story. It says his name is Andreas Fuentes. His mule train got bushwhacked by Indians yesterday. Everyone else was killed. Says they got his horse. Ask him what tribe. Que en Dios te atacaron. Posible payutes. We met some payutes yesterday. I wager it was them. Pick up the trail and be fresh. Take doy. And do what exactly? Get this fellow's horse back. Doy, let's get moving. Kit, you're sure this is necessary? Necessary. Smith, take the ridge. James, the east. Johnson, look alive up there. They need help. We're going to go help. These guys did wrong. They've got to pay for it. Spurred by his strong sense of right and wrong, Kit Carson is out to recover stolen horses for a man he doesn't even know. When they come upon him, they see that they're outnumbered. So what do you do? You should low crawl that way through the horse picket. Sneak him off. Ah, oh, heck. When I say we both rise and shoot. After countless fights on the frontier, Carson has learned that the element of surprise is a powerful advantage. Now! The next day, Carson and Godoy return to Fremont's camp, their mission accomplished. Hello. 
boys, we made her back. Fremont is deeply impressed by this. He's impressed because the Mexican man is completely unknown to them. And yet Carson feels so strongly about right and wrong that he's not allowing this injustice and these murders to stand. If you were able to retake this man's horse, why didn't you take more? You could sure use them. Wasn't well, that to steal horses. Just take them back, which rightfully his. Remarking on the circumstances under which he recovered the stolen horses, Carson said, we were determined to have satisfaction. Let the consequence be ever so fatal. And I think that says a lot about what Kit Carson uh, believed in, in terms of the law of self-preservation, the law of retribution, and the law of the gun. Carson's fame gets yet another boost when long simmering tensions between the United States and the Republic of Mexico finally boil over. Storm clouds were brewing with Mexico on the Rio Grande. President James K. Polk knew that war was going to come because he was going to start it. At the time, the idea of, of pushing west was already seen as part of America's particular destiny, and that anything that was an impediment would have to be uh, eliminated. We had a manifest destiny to move into the American West. In the Mexican-American War of 1846, Carson's extraordinary skill as a scout and guide faces a grueling test. A detachment of troops led by U.S. Army General Stephen Kearney is surrounded by superior Mexican forces. They're surrounded by Mexicans uh, outnumbered um, by a huge amount, and it's clear that they cannot uh, survive this. The Americans are hungry, thirsty, and in a bad position. They have wounded that need care. But if they try to break out, it's going to be at the cost of an enormous number of lives. Any way out, Mr. Cross? I saw a place. A two or three could slip through. Do you think you could reach Commodore Stockton in San Diego? I reckon so. I've already written the dispatch. You have three copies. Choose two men and go at once. So you already knew I'd go, General? I heard you were the best scout in the West. Even before we met, you've proven it since. General, with your permission, I'd like to accompany Mr. Carson. I'll take Chimukta, too. Very well, good luck. Once again, Kit Carson puts his life on the line. They're going to creep through the Mexican lines and get to the coast and, and bring help. If anyone's going to do this, it's going to be Kit Carson. And everyone certainly expects him to, because after all, he's, he's Kit Carson. Yo, we can slip through here. Go slow. This is life or death. If we don't get word back, to Stockton that Carney needs help, he's not going to make it. Bill, Jamonta, boots. Quickly, they figure out their shoes are, are going to be a problem. They're making too much noise on the rocks. They have to be so quiet that they, in fact, take their boots off. and they have to go barefoot. And of course, the whole area is just overgrown with prickly pear cactus and other kinds of cactus. Approaching the enemy lines, Carson and his companions get within earshot of well-armed Mexican troops. If the Mexicans heard uh, a rock move, uh, a bush rustle, they would have been discovered. With Mexican soldiers just a few feet away, Carson can't slip away unseen. 
Leaving him with two bad options, surrender or fight his way out. Moments from being discovered by alert Mexican sentries, Kit Carson needs to make a life or death decision. Carson wisely chooses to remain hidden until the sentries depart. Only to discover a serious new problem just moments later. They crawl four or five hundred yards out into the desert when they all discover their shoes are gone. They had fallen out of their belt during the crawl. After losing their shoes while escaping from Mexican troops, Carson, Beal, and the Delaware scout Chamukta have endured a hellish night. They're walking across a fairly typical desert environment that had rocks and sticks and brush. They're walking in that environment for 30 miles. Yet when dawn breaks, they're still dozens of miles from San Diego. We have to split up, take different routes. Mr. Bill, you head due west. It's the straightest line towards San Diego. One of us will make it. Their chances of success are slim, but Carson's determined to try. Godspeed, Mr. Carson. Good luck. After eluding enemy patrols and marching 35 miles across a scorching desert, all three men reach San Diego with General Carney's message. It's a feat of extraordinary endurance and courage. Kit Carson it becomes a central figure in the conquest of California, which is going to very soon be admitted to the Union as a state. And so this further burnishes Kit Carson's uh, career. By the war's end in 1848, the U.S. has added 1.2 million square miles of territory, including New Mexico, Arizona, and California. After years of hard living on the frontier and dangerous service in war, Carson has decided to start a life at home with his wife, Josefa. Well, with the Mexican War over, Carson really wants to settle down with his growing family. Fremont, in fact, asked him to go on a fourth expedition, but Carson declines. I saw him win Carpintero. Kit Carson, the frontier hero, is now going to become Kit Carson, the small-time rancher. But Carson's life as a gentleman rancher is about to be disrupted by a crisis on the Santa Fe Trail. I've settled it. We're stopping for the night. A little more time by the fire would be welcome. James White is a merchant from Missouri who's come west with his brother, and they've decided to set up a mercantile operation in Santa Fe. 
He decided that it would be safe enough to bring his wife and daughter down the trail and set up a more permanent presence in, in Santa Fe. James, are you certain we should stay here alone? Just for one night. They'll be waiting for us at the next water. But when James's wife, Anne, falls ill, he makes a fatal decision. We'll be fine. The only safety on the Santa Fe Trail was in numbers. And even a hunter that would go off from the main party was in great danger. Now, Wager, you could use some coffee. But White was determined, and he was in charge of his own party, and so off they went. James White is taking a terrible risk because the Hickorias, a notoriously dangerous band of Apaches, are on the warpath. There weren't even probably 500 Hickorias, but they were sort of the hardest cases in New Mexico and were always a threat to travelers on the Santa Fe Trail. Lobo Blanco is a Hickoria Apache leader. His own daughter has been captured by the U.S. Army. And so in retribution, he leads a raid along the settlements of the frontier of New Mexico. And in October of 1849, Lobo Blanco ambushes the whites. In a lightning raid, the Apaches kill James White, plunder his wagon, and kidnap his wife and infant daughter. News of the attack soon reaches Kit Carson, who now must decide if he's willing to risk his life for strangers yet again. While traveling the Santa Fe Trail, James and Ann White have been attacked by an Apache war party. James White is dead, and Ann and her infant daughter are now captives. Major William Greer of the 1st U.S. Dragoons is immediately dispatched to track the Apaches and, if possible, rescue Ann White. Major Greer. Greer wanted the most famous scout in America with him, and so he came to Rayada to get Kit Carson. You probably know why I'm here. I heard. Terrible thing. Apaches, wasn't they? Riding after them, the four picked men. I could use your help finding their track. Need your help, Kit. Kit Carson has no interest in fame or glory, but he can't sit by when innocents are in danger. I get my rifle and kit. This is Carson. He knew that his knowledge and expertise would be useful. And so he went because, oh, you could say the code of the West. You helped your neighbors. You helped people who were in need. He went because it was the thing to do. Carson begins seeking the Apache's trail at the site of their brutal attack. Watch your step, Major. Well, it's pretty clear that Ann White and her child have both been kidnapped. Their bodies are not at the scene of the ambush, although there's evidence of both of them. I left coffee. In a mirror, means I was in a hurry.
need to move, Major. What's our kit? No. We need to bury this man. There's no time. The track is still fresh. Major! We need to go! The trail is faint, but Carson's uncanny tracking ability keeps the rescue party close behind the fleeing Apaches. This is a heartbreaking story. The men are all determined to save this young mother and her child. This is a challenge to their manhood, and it's also their sort of ideal as frontiersmen. This is what Kit Carson is supposed to do. Rescue people, save people, do his duty, and he's, he's determined to do it. Complicating Carson's task is the fact the Apaches know they're being followed and are trying to cover their tracks. When they were being pursued, when they broke camp, the Indians would split up and scatter like quail in every direction of the compass. The Indian that carried her would have carried her double, in other words, two people on one horse. And he could tell from that because the hoof print in the soil would be ever so little bit deeper. Carson later said it was the most difficult trail he ever followed. But if he doesn't find Ann White soon, she will probably be killed. How long ago were they here? At least a day. She's leaving breadcrumbs. The scrap of fabric left by Anne gives Carson new hope. They knew they were getting closer, and they knew that she was marking the trail. She knew they were coming. Well, I mean, she's alive. It was yesterday. But every hour that passes makes it less likely he'll find her before it's too late. <laughs> Frontier scout Kit Carson is in a desperate chase to rescue Ann White and her daughter from Apache raiders, but time is running out. As they came upon Indian camp after Indian camp, they found little pieces of Mrs. White's clothing. The fact that she knew they were coming made it all the more important to them to get to her and save her. Carson tracks the Apaches for 200 miles across New Mexico, almost reaching the Texas border. Carson sees the Apaches on a ridge line. He rides up there. He knows he's got them. He immediately takes off. He's going to go take care of business. Carson's only hope of saving Ann White is to attack at once while the Apaches are still in the open. We need to attack, sir, now. No, we need to be sure these are the Apaches we've been following. Greer is not confident that this group of Indians were the ones that took Mrs. White. They seemed to be way too far off course. We're wasting time, sir. Nobody move. That's an order. We're wasting time. Carson, on the other hand, he's like, no, we have to attack now. If we're going to save this woman and rescue this child, it's kill or be killed. We have to charge, we have to fight. The one with a child, sir! <laughs> but the Apaches themselves cut short the debate by opening fire. While he's hesitating, Greer gets shot, and the bullet doesn't kill him, but it almost knocks him off his horse. Men, on me now! Greer knows there will be no negotiating with the Apaches, and orders his troopers to charge. <laughs> <laughs> 
in the thick of this, one of the soldiers sees Anne White try to escape. It's actually one of the Apache women that shoots Anne White with an arrow and kills her. Her body is discovered a few minutes later. She's still warm. Baby, there's no sign of her kid. Child's nowhere to be seen. It's unknown if the baby is alive or dead. The fate of Ann White's infant child, Virginia White, uh, is one of the great mysteries of early New Mexico territory. Fall in. We're 100 miles from Vegas. That's five days pushing it on horseback. Major Greer. said, this was found in the dead woman's belongings, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you, Scout. What Greer's men find on her body turns a tragic tale into an unforgettable legend of the Old West. We found this with Ann. It's about you, kid. The mission to rescue Anne White has ended in failure. Thank you, Scout. But a book found with her body makes her death intensely personal for Kit Carson. They have a satchel that had belonged to her, and in it is a book. Charles Averill's Kit Carson, Prince of the Gold Hunters. This is the very first sort of blood and thunder novel ever written about Kit Carson. Anne had been reading a book about Carson himself when she was taken, and would have been praying for him to save her up until her final moments. This is just a breathtaking moment. It's one of the most remarkable moments in all of Western history. Kit Carson, Kit Carson, he echoed bewildered. That is a... Kit had been curious about what the book said and why she might have had it. But within a very short time, it became apparent to him what the deal was. Kit Carson, Kit Carson, he echoed bewildered. That is the name of the famous hunter and adventurer of the Great West. He thought, what if she read that book and she thought that she might be rescued by this heroic figure who could do anything? And she was waiting for him to sweep in and, and uh, save her from this unspeakable fate. And he never did. The daring guide and leader of Fremont's expedition. Oh, dude. There's your group. In here.
He's horrified by what they made him into and the, the fact that they made him into something that he can't live up to. It significantly affected Kit. He was never quite the same after that. As the legend meets the man head on, and the man can't live up to the legend, because the myths of the West, what later will become the Hollywood stories, well, they're not reality. Reality is what happens to Mrs. White and her baby. And Kit Carson never forgives himself for his failure to rescue Mrs. White. As his fame grows, Carson struggles to accept notoriety he never wanted. Carson was so renowned even in his own time, that the myth got much bigger than the man. And he himself was surprised uh, and a little perplexed by the myth of Kit Carson. Near the end of his life, he said, I've always tried to do right. Maybe I didn't, but I always tried to do the right thing. He was the iconic American hero. Honest as he could be, responsible, always interested in doing the right thing, and generally successful at doing that. He deserves high acclaim and a rich and honorable place in our history. <laughs> 